Now, we're on the clock today, so we're going all filler today. If you could only say one thing today on this panel, Patrick Campbell, about social robotics <clears throat> to fire up our audience, what would it be? I would say that the robots that are today that you see in the marketplace are incredible marvels of technology, but they're not nearly as intelligent as people expect them to be. Mm, so you're talking about the foothills here? That's correct. Well, just blow our minds a bit. Where do you think we could be headed with the right talent? Uh, I think it goes into the expectations. When you see a robot like Milo or a robot like Spot, <clears throat> what it should be able to do versus what it can do today. And bridging those gaps in uh, technology, artificial intelligence, uh, and helping get to a useful application today takes a lot of work. Right, yes it does. So, uh, Kamal, your one thing, where do you begin? I would say that, you know, the social robots are the present and the future. Um, because social robots, you know, if we look at the word social, you know, it relates to a community. Yeah. Community of people, community of animals, community of fish, whatever it is. And so having robots that have ability to work with other robots, other people, other communities is very, very important. But then having all of the abilities and capabilities to be in those environments, you know, working safely, reliably, precisely, yeah. and so on. Yeah. yeah. And how about you, Richard? What would you say to someone to really wake them up to the impact on humanity social robots could have? Because it's more than just the fun thing to tell your friends about. Sure. You know, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. I agree with what's been said, but ultimately the impact that we have the, the potential for is to really use these technologies to enhance and empower individuals and to bring the entire kind of world up with it. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So, Kamal, take us briefly inside your world. Take us into the lab. Tell us a little bit about your work. Um, so, I'm Kamal Yusuf Tumi. I'm uh, uh, a professor in mechanical uh, engineering at MIT. I do work in uh, modeling, simulation, control systems uh, with applications to um, uh, robotics, automation, and intelligent systems. Uh, in my lab, when we refer to intelligent systems, we mean systems that can learn fast. They can learn from sm small amounts of data. They do things in real time with rapid adaptation. And this is also for multi-dimensional, uh, multivariate uh, types of uh, uh, systems. Um, and uh, I, I'd like to mention that uh, I've been working with our friends in, uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia for about 16 years. Yeah. Uh, I was a co-director of the Center for Clean Water and Clean Energy. This is between MIT and, and KFUPM, King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals. Um, and also, I'm um, also the director from the MIT side on the Center for Complex Engineering Systems. So this one is all on digital technologies for many different uh, applications, uh, water, energy, labor, transportation, health, and also the intersection uh, between them. This uh, program with the CACs that started uh, in 2011, and it's going to go until 2028. And then last but not least, uh, the Ibn Khaldun, fellowship program for Saudi women. Uh, so this is uh, another uh, program that we have also with the uh, CAXT. And we are very uh, proud to have these programs uh, because of their very uh, impactful outputs. Yeah. yeah. No, well, kudos on those programs. Patrick, tell us a little bit more about the work. Just very briefly, just give us a flavor. We see uh, Boston Dynamics making the headlines constantly, but, but, but give us a bit more. Sure. Well, I think if I had to break it down, I have to translate the marvel of dancing robots on YouTube to useful applications at the customer, right? So how do you go from a robot that can do different dance steps to a robot that can enrich and create value in my organization? So I work with brilliant 
engineers and technologists within Boston Dynamics to, uh, to bridge the gap from capabilities to <clears throat> business value. Right, so what's the secret then? Because we've heard a lot today about the theory. What's the secret to translating something from the great potential in theory to a practical use that somebody can actually benefit from? What have you learned? You gotta start simple, right? I, I think it's great to think big, but find applications that are valuable, mm -hmm. but less complex, right. and then build on that. How important in that mix, Patrick, is public perception? What the public make of these uh, individuals, shall we say? And by the way, how's that shifting? Well, I think that Hollywood has not done robots and roboticists any favors. Right? The, the images that have been created over time with <clears throat> robots have largely trended to the negative, and that's created people's reactions to a robot within their premises, within their workplace, right. within their classroom. Um, and so there is a lot of education and awareness that has to go into uh, bringing the end user to see that the robot's there to help, not hurt. Right. I almost saw an imperceptible little nod there from Milo. Richard, um, surely Milo's never had a negative reaction. Oh, he's had plenty of negative reactions. In the early prototype phases, I remember taking him to big events like Wired Next Fest, and um, I had a, an older uh, lady one time so angry that a technology like this existed, she spit in my face. Um, and it was, it was just out of fear. And what I had think, angered her? What had angered her? Your translation was fear? Fear. It was just, and I think it was a lot of what Patrick just mentioned. It was the Hollywood perception that's been built through things like Terminator and all these, these evil characters, and occasionally one turns good. So, so how do we get this the right way around? Because one school of thought says create, then educate. The other says listen first. Listen to what the public want, might be ready for. Where are you on that side? I'm mixed on that, honestly. Um, I think you, you need to understand the needs of the people you're building for. Yeah. But we also need to understand that, I mean, from my perspective, we're pushing the boundaries. All of us here are pushing the boundaries. And that means that people don't always know what's possible, so they don't know what to ask for. Got it. Got it. Kamal, what can you teach us about user experience? What have you learned along the well, way? Well, I mean, if I may make a quick comment about robots. Uh, you know, many years ago, the robotics community uh, made some definition of a robot, something that is programmable, it uh, uh, carries out some tasks, and then it maybe moves some things. So that is the case, so uh, uh, a washing machine would be yes. a robot, yeah. a, uh, uh, a garage door opener will be a robot, so that means we've been using robots you know, for uh, quite some time. Uh, but I think the interesting thing in our case, uh, and I would say that I'm, I've been privileged to be at MIT you know, for more than uh, 40 years and working with very, very uh, talented uh, people, uh, faculty and, and students, but in the, in the lab, uh, you know, we also have the um, uh, opportunity to work with the leading uh, companies uh, in the world, like uh, Boston Dynamics mm -hmm. uh, and, and other companies. And so with those companies, you know, not only we do the, some fundamental research, but also a lot of applied, uh, applied research. Um, uh, targeting, you know, this is like a, a disruptive technologies, whether it's in the processes, the machines themselves, you know, or, uh, or otherwise. Um, and so this is uh, uh, the thing that in the lab we, we do uh, model simulations and we build the prototypes, yeah. you know, from you know, end to end, from the instrumentation to the software and so on. But I must say that uh, maybe it's similar to what Patrick said, uh, in my students, myself, our researchers, all these simulations, you know, does nothing to them. But when something moves, a robot moves, and it becomes live, that is the time. And you see, you know, the big light on the people's faces and the smiles and, and so on. And it's not only a, important, you know, for research, uh, but also exciting people to do this kind of work because it's multidisciplinary. It involves, you know, many, many disciplines, you know, to go into these uh, uh, robots, particularly robots for uh, uh, industries and other... Uh, other well, we want, we want to understand more about how these social robots are going to change workplaces, but I've got to pick you up on something, Professor Kamal. You mentioned fish earlier. Surely there's no such thing as a robot fish. Yes, uh, the important thing is that we're doing some work for, um, uh, for Singapore, and this is to look at the, uh, the marine life, like all the water around Singapore, to look at the water and all of the life within, uh, within the water. 
And the interesting thing there was to uh, uh, look at it in its natural state. You know, you can't use like a submersible robot with a propeller. It will disturb the piece. It will uh, intrude on that peaceful uh, environment. So, uh, so we designed uh, fish and stingray robots. They look like fish and they look like stingrays. They move like them and so on. And this is they're all instrumented and they go and monitor, pick up information from the water, from all of this life. Yeah. And then it can observe, you know, the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, that life into the ocean. And you can do it like over, over times and then you can use other uh, information, predictive, predictive technologies. Yes. In that Incredible. <clears throat> and perhaps featuring in the next James Bond film. We just don't know. <laughs> perhaps, yeah, yeah. Patrick, paint us a picture, the workplace of the future. How will social robots be involved? Let's, we've got to be quite snappy. We're going to go through the gears now because I want to talk more about education, please. Sure, well, with Boston Dynamics and with Spot particularly, uh, we've <clears> really started with a solution that was kind of looking for a problem, and we've now zeroed in on what we've gotten feedback from our customers, which is the robot is a wonderful industrial inspection platform. Uh -huh. So when, what that means is we would leverage the robot in the workplace to collect information throughout, you know, in consistent and persistent ways. Right. Because that work zone was too dangerous, too dirty for humans. A absolutely. It's keeping humans out of harm's way, uh, um, augmenting the labor force that certainly aren't available right now to do some of these jobs. All right, so, so just give us one more, because I think there's nobody that would disagree, yes. G give us one that you think will push the boundaries even further, maybe in ways that might make us feel a bit uncomfortable. Wow. Uh, well, I think a lot of times the robots, just by nature of being there, create some discomfort. But I think that, um, you know, we look at Boston Dynamics, we're looking at, you know, the next form factor of the robot, the next... Uh, application that either needs to be done or is being underperformed and we focus there okay. and so whether it's a, a humanoid robot like Atlas right which creates you know all kinds of opportunities beyond industrial uh, could be even human healthcare, yeah. it could be assistance. Uh, I think there are a lot of potential applications for intelligent robots uh, as we go forward. So tell me something here then Richard um, where are the pitfalls on education, for example. What's wrong with a robot teacher? Well, uh, the robots aren't quite all the way there to teach today, but looking, looking forward, um, you know, with, with my focus, my focus is using technology to help people. And in the case of autism, we're trying to actually use this technology to get people back to being able to speak with other people. Yeah. So for a lot of people, that's not intuitive. They don't believe that this should work. But the reality is, is the robot is a starting point. It's not the end point. And these kids have trouble with other people. So why start with people? That's have been the any, only have you got any numbers on that, Richard, just to make us think where Milo has proved a better alternative than something else? Sure. So one of our, our best early stats from a, a, a study at University of Texas was in traditional human-to-human -human therapy, these, these children are only engaging 2 to 3% of the time with their therapist. And with Milo, it's as much as 90%. So we're not talking about incremental. We're talking about significant multiples. And we know engagement is the starting point for all learning. Yeah. Let me ask you a question, Kamal. We've talked about AI never at this summit. As you're speaking with your students, where are some of the red lines? So, uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> AI and machine learning and so on, people have spoke about this, uh, you know, in this conference, uh, that it has solved many, many problems. But I see that in many, maybe you might say, uh, mission critical type of applications, you know, that uh, you might want to have a, um, a human uh, in the loop. Uh, because mm -hmm. there are many things that we can do very easily that the machine would have a very hard time doing. You know, you can grab your glass, manipulate it, and then, you know, fold the towel, for example. Yeah. A robot has very, very difficult, you know, many difficulties handling soft materials, for example, mm -hmm. and also making decisions. You know, they can make decisions, but there are other abilities that we can do, like reasoning, understanding the scene, yes. with all of this perception. And so, uh, to have uh, robots at that level and machines, you know, then can be a danger, I think. And yeah, so, understood. Yeah. Patrick, give us some red lines. <laughs> Well, it's very clear for us, it's uh, our robots cannot do harm. 
And so that means intimidation, it means weaponization, it means any type of you know, fear-inducing behaviors on the robot. We are very explicit about that with our end customers, and that is actually written into our contract, and we feel very strong. So let's explore that. How about making somebody feel negative? That is harmful, and Richard and Kamal have both pointed to the idea that robots can change how we feel. Right. It, is it deliberate? Maybe, maybe not, right? I think there are certainly some gray areas there. I think we do work very closely with our partners to understand their intent uh, and, and certainly raise you know, concerns where so we are. Just help me unpick something, just very, very briefly, three of you. I get a sense of playfulness. There's an outward valuable end point, but there's been a sandbox in between through dancing, through we didn't quite know where this would go. Help us understand how we play without wasting time. Richard? I don't think play is ever wasting time. It's exploration. I mean, I think the things you guys do with you know, the dances are amazing, but they're, they're, to get there, what you have to do is incredible. The things we had to do, the problems we had to solve to make Milo what he is today was just so multidisciplinary and involved so many creative people then there was so much joy as part of it. There were lots of problems, so many failures, but we, we got there through just pushing through and continuing to explore. The question though, Kamal, is when? When do we have to show social value? When does the play and the imagination have to stop? The imagination never has to stop, but yeah. seriously, what do you say? Well, I think there are some times where you have to show some preliminary work, you know, with some demonstrations, you know, when you're talking to companies, sponsors, yeah. and so on. You know, and there has to be something so that people can see it and they believe. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and then, uh, because in, in our case, unlike, like, for example, Boston Dynamics or other uh, places, we don't make products, right? We focus more on the ideas, make the, all the technology, the fundamental work, the prototypes that go with them, yeah. and then somebody else will take, uh, will take that. Yeah. But then with the fun, the lab is fun. All of these things with the robot, things moving, the software, you know, uh, it, it makes things, you know, very, very, uh, uh, very uh, fun and cool. I bet. Well, we all want to yes. come and visit now. So Please um, I haven't prepared you for these, uh, this final question, Richard, but we throw unlimited resources at you mm -hmm. today. Where'd you go with it? What'd you do? Um, I think if, if I had unlimited resources, we would really move into a next generation that had a lot more capabilities, onboard computing, the ability to really sense, interact with, and from what I do, empathize with people, and work towards that so we better understand the people we're working with so that we can help them as effectively as possible. Yeah, I hope you attract great conversations from what you've just said. Thank you. Kamal, let's go in a time machine. Let's go uh, and see a smart city at its best. This is something you focus on. Yes. Where are you taking us and why? Yeah, I think uh, one can think of it like a car. You know, you have a car, has all these computers with management systems and controls, and then it tells you about, you know, your, if it's uh, a gasoline car, gas, uh, battery level, um, uh, the, the uh, components, you know, their, uh, their health, and so on. So now imagine the city in the same way, right? So you have uh, all of kinds of uh, institutions that are providing services, you know, to the, to the uh, citizens, and then how you do that one in a very, a very effective and efficient way. And at the same time, a city, like a nation, has a lot of resources that it's using, uh, water, energy, other things. And then it also consumes and produces waste. Uh, consuming well, uh, water, for example, for drinking. Uh, uh, the waste could be uh, CO2, could be brine, for example, from a uh, desalination plants. And imagine having a very intelligent system that is, and then all of these things are instrumented, and you can all see them, mm. right, in real time, how they are performing. And, and if I said to you, Kamal, I want to see this in practice, where do you take us on the, on the planet? I say neon. Where let's, else? Let's yeah. go to neon, the new yes. city, the, the, world, should, the we, world leading vision, right? We should go there, yes. Yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> well, a, a invitation accepted. <laughs> How about you, Patrick Campbell, when you're giving your own team a pep talk and you say, let's impact humanity, what, what, what is the most crucial thing for you that stops you getting there? You know, what, what do, will you have to do to fulfill that objective? Because it's, you know, it's possible. Yeah, I think we have to continue to show that the robot 
is enriching people's lives, right? And is doing things that they either wouldn't do or couldn't do yeah. themselves. And develop, I mean, there's plenty of, of work to do to fill the entire uh, spectrum of capabilities, and we're going to continue to do that. And I think once we get there, uh, the rest will play out on its own. Yeah. Patrick, Kamal, Richard, and of course, our final cheer for Milo. My huge thanks to you all for being such brilliant sharing guests today. Thank you very much indeed. Fantastic. And that makes me want to ask a hundred more questions. Thank you very much as they leave the stage. Thank you. And thank you, Milo, as well.